So the text that uh, I'm going to read you in just a moment comes from the Acts of the Apostles, which is really a whole lot about Paul. And today uh, we have an episode that is going to feature a woman prominently. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the regions of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit kept them from speaking the word in the province of Asia. When they approached the province of, of Mysia, they tried to enter the province of Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't let them. Passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, Troy, instead. A vision of a man from Macedonia came to Paul during the night. He stood up urging Paul, come over to Macedonia and help us. Immediately after he saw this vision, we, Paul and his followers, prepared to leave for the province of Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We sailed from Troas straight for Samothrace and then came to Neapolis the following day. From there, we went to Philippi, a city of Macedonia's first district and a Roman colony. We stayed in that city for several days. And on the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the riverbank where we thought there might be a place for prayer, meaning that there might be a synagogue there or also that it may be that the followers of, of Yahweh may be meeting there informally to pray. We sat down and began to talk with the women who had gathered. One of those women was Lydia, a Gentile God worshiper from the, from the city of Thyatira, a dealer in purple cloth. As she listened, the Lord enabled her to embrace Paul's message. Once she and her household were baptized, she urged, now that you have decided that I am a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And so she persuaded us. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. I don't think it we can underestimate how important it is that we acknowledge the very critical role women have played in the Christ movement since its very beginnings. You know, we often think of Paul as being misogynistic, and some of the readings attributed to him certainly are, even though they're not likely to have been written by Paul himself. To be sure, he was a Jewish Christian male in the first century, and that is a very different historical and social location than our own. But we've heard in this scene from Acts of the Apostles what happens when he is sent by Jesus, by Christ, to Philippi in Macedonia, which is now part of Greece. He goes down to the river on the Sabbath and he begins to talk with women which in itself is a little bit unusual. The women who were gathered there. And here he meets Lydia, a Gentile woman who worships Yahweh. We learn a couple of important things about Lydia. She is the mistress of her own household. That's important. We don't know whether she didn't have a husband or whether she was just the head of the household. And we learn that she and her household, the people whom she influenced most directly, were baptized by Paul. We hear that she is a dealer in purple cloth, a luxury item. So purple dye in those days came from the murex snail, and it was difficult to produce, and it was costly. And so it became associated, purple cloth became associated with royalty. It's why during Lent, we use purple as the liturgical color. Once Lydia and her household heard the good news from Paul and had been baptized, she invites them in to stay with her. A another sign, not just of radical hospitality, but perhaps also of patronage. This is really important in the ancient world. We have clients and we have patrons. After Paul and Silas are imprisoned and then escape, they come back to Lydia's house again. The Church Universal has 
an enormous apology to make to women. Not just today, but women across the millennia for denying them a place at the table, denying their spiritual gifts, barring them from ordination and office, and for diminishing or dismissing their vision, their faith, their hard work, their ministry, and even their very lives. If we truly believed with Paul that in Christ there is no east or west, male or female, we sure have a funny way of showing it. Even in our own congregational tradition, we bear the shame of banishing Anne Hutchinson from the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the 1630s for teaching and interpreting scripture. Heavens. You know, as an ordained man, I, I, I don't think saying, I'm sorry for my own and for my forebear's ignorance. I don't think that's quite enough, although I say it. So I'm going to tell you some stories of Christian women in the early church to at least make sure their names are spoken and their stories are heard and understood. The painting that you've been looking at is an early funerary painting of a Christian woman. If she looks Mediterranean to you, that's because she is. And all Christians were in the early centuries of our faith. There were very few Norwegians in the ancient Near East. <laughs> the main female figure of early Christianity, of course. Oh, are you going to stop now? We can do it. Oh, sorry. Okay, avert your eyes for just a second. Okay, you can look now. Yay. The main female figure in early Christianity is, of course, Mary, the mother of Jesus. The Orthodox Church honors her as the Theotokos, the God-bearer. And she's the subject of amazing imagery throughout the ages. But our forebears, the reformers, did something horrible. They basically eliminated devotion to Mary, and we Protestants have become poorer for it. She's a central image of the divine feminine in our tradition. You know, I was so touched by what Jane Ann was saying to those five girls, because that is such an important message for girls to hear. And it's not one that I ever heard in the church growing up. So in this painting of the Annunciation, she's in dialogue, Mary's in dialogue with the arch archangel Michael, and she consents to bearing the Christ child. And in this fresco from the church of San Frediano, and even though Frediano sounds really Italian, he was an, an Irish monk. I don't think they called him Frediano in Dublin. Um, but this, this is a, 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 an early fresco in Lucca, uh, in Italy, and she's in conversation with her older cousin Elizabeth, who is carrying John the Baptizer. I love this image by Botticelli called Mary of the Magnificat. Remember during Advent, we always read the Magnificat from Luke's Gospel. And you'll notice that she is writing um, Luke's Gospel in Latin, no less, uh, Magnificat anima mea dominum. My soul magnifies the Lord. But she's not the only Mary in Jesus' life. Mary of Magdala is described in some Christian tradition as the apostle to the apostles. She doesn't flee like the male disciples at the foot of the cross, but she stays there with Jesus and then goes to the empty tomb where Jesus tells her not to touch him since he has not yet ascended to God. This is in um, the Museum of San Marco in, in Florence, and it's by Fra Angelico. 
Pope Gregory I, in his infinite wisdom in 591, conflated the story of Mary with the unnamed faithful disciple who anoints Jesus' feet and wipes them with her hair that we just sang about in that hymn. And in doing so, he perpetuated unfounded gossip that she was a repentant prostitute. Does it ever say anything in scripture about her being a prostitute? No, it does not. Legend say, says that she left Gaul, modern France, and left for Gaul and lived there. And JT and his wife are flying there tomorrow to learn more about Mary of Magdala. So I'm imagining that we are gonna hear some good stories when JT gets back. Women are well represented in the first centuries of Christianity in the art of Christianity in the Mediterranean, including this uh, mosaic, which is now in a museum in Cortona, Italy. Look at the position of her hands. This is a posture of prayer in the early church. And sometimes you'll see me and Jane Ann and JT when we're blessing the communion table, you'll see us in this position. It's called the orons or the praying position. And when a woman is in this position, it signifies that she is a woman of deep faith. It's not the only time you're gonna see that position. This is a woman on a third century marble sarcophagus now in the Vatican Museum, again portraying a woman's living faith. This is a fourth century mosaic, also in the Vatican Museum, showing a woman again in that position of faith. And this is a little bit difficult to see, but it's <clears throat> a very early Christian glass medallion of a woman with an inscription which you probably can't read around the top, Dulcis Spiritus, a sweet spirit. One of the most interesting churches, <clears throat> pardon me, in Rome is called Santa Priscilla, and it was founded in the fourth century, in the 300s. This image above the chancel is a mosaic, and it shows Jesus in the center, and on your left, St. Paul, with his arm around Santa Priscilla, and then further over to the left is Pope Pascal. You'll notice that Pascal has something that looks like a spacesuit helmet. Um, and it is not a spacesuit helmet. It's actually a square nimbus, a square halo. And what that indicates is that he is still living. So here we have St. Peter in Santa Prudenziana, along with a priest holding a Bible. Notice where his arm is. This is Peter, keeper of the keys to the kingdom of God. And in this close-up, we see Santa Prisada and Paul. You can tell that it's Paul because he has a very distinguished hairline, just like mine. <laughs> does, this, does this look like Paul the misogynist to you? Does, he, does it seem to illustrate the subordination and the repression of women to you? Just wait, it gets even better in a dark side chapel in the church of Santa Prisada, the, the church of San Zeno, there are four women in this mosaic. And I'm gonna focus on the woman on your left. And I'm sorry that the image is kind of fuzzy because it is a dark chapel. And I flick the lights on with a, you know, a one euro coin and then, well, there it is. So the woman on your left <clears throat> is Episcopa Theodora. You can see, I, I kind of wrote in the letters that you really can't read on that mosaic. Episkopos is a Greek masculine noun for an overseer. So epi means over and skopos means seeing. It's the Greek word for bishop. And which is why the Anglican communion in this country is called the Episcopal Church because it's run by bishops. But wait a minute. How could there be a woman episcopa, a feminine noun, a, a, a woman bishop? Now, some historians have suggested that she herself wasn't a bishop, but that her husband was. 
Okay, does anyone else share their liturgical title with the spouse in the church? I mean, we don't call pastors, spouses, present company accepted, um, reverend unless they're ordained too. And wait, did, did someone say wife of a bishop? Huh. Anybody know any Roman Catholic bishops who are married? Any, anyone? Anyone? Um, actually, married priesthood has been a part of the church longer than celibate priesthood. Priests were allowed to marry until the Second Vatican Council in 1139 AD. And women bishops? You may have heard John Philip Newell on in our chancel 10 days ago, telling of the legend of St. Bridget of Kildare, who was consecrated by a bishop named Mel in Ireland. And an early text has him putting down objections by saying, no power have I in this matter. The dignity has been given to God, by God to Bridget, beyond every woman. Hmm. So these are pieces of an altar in the great church of Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, which of course was uh, built by the emperor Constantine as a church. And then later after Constantinople became Istanbul, it became uh, a mosque and today it's a museum. But if you look at that panel on the right, you'll see a woman at the table presiding with an altar boy who's holding the missile, who's holding the words of the liturgy. And again, of course, she's in the Oron's position. This object is made from ivory, and it's probably third or fourth century. Um, It's a PYX, P-Y-X, which is a vessel for storing consecrated communion hosts that can be saved for later or brought off-site to a communicant. It's kind of strange, isn't it, that it's decorated with women in the Oran's posture? Could it have been that women consecrated the bread? These three women are standing at an altar with a man in this mosaic. Again, could it be that women were priests and deacons in the early church? Not surprisingly, some men found this very threatening to their sense of power and authority. And they did their best to ensure that women were driven from church leadership. This image is from a cave in Ephesus, like the letter to the Ephesians in modern day Turkey. Paul is on your left, and you can just barely see his name in in this slide, but it's Paulos. And on his right is a woman named Thecla. Thecla is one of the great heroines of the early church. Both she and Paul have two fingers raised, and this is the posture of teaching and proclamation. She was a powerful figure. So someone took it upon themselves to gouge out her eyes and to chip away and then to burn her fingers in the teaching position. This isn't the end of the story. The Empress Theodora was the patroness of the magnificent church of San Apollinaris in Ravenna, Italy, which was then the capital of the Western Roman Empire. You may know about the incredible mosaics there, including this one showing her as the patroness. Remember, patron and client, and her retinue endowing the church with communion vessels. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to turn on your time machine and fast forward 1,300 years to upstate New York. Antoinette Brown, later Antoinette Brown Blackwell, was the first woman ordained in the modern church in 1852 by her congregational church in upstate New York. She had graduated from Oberlin College in Ohio, 
the first coeducational college in the country founded by Congregationalists. But the faculty got a little bit touchy when she wanted to do a graduate degree in theology. But since at Oberlin, the founding policy of the institution was co-educational, she was admitted and she, was grad and she graduated. This was a monumental step for women's ordination in the modern world. But it took until the 20th century for many mainline denominations to embrace the ordination of women. You know, I, I listed some of the, the churches here, and Jean Ann wanted me to remind you that in the Southern Baptist Convention, local churches were ordaining women in the 1960s until the men put an end to that. You know, we have so far to go not just within the parts of the Christian household that refuse to ordain women, but in the UCC and here at Plymouth. We have amazing women in this congregation, women who have served as moderators, as deacons, as clergy, We need to give thanks and honor the gifts of these women leaders, both lay and ordained. And we must support them in sharing their gifts with us as they help to guide us as a congregation into the future of this beloved community. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>